My name is Monk Rowe, and we're in Utica, New York. I'm pleased to have musician David Fink with me, and congratulations on playing the best instrument. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. It doesn't feel like that all the time, but uh, it's been mine for yes. a number of years now. So. I just am enamored of the bass and its role in music, you know, not only jazz, but jazz especially. Do you have a philosophy about your role as a bassist? I do have a philosophy about my role as a bassist. The, my primary concern, should I be looking at you or at the camera? You can look at me. At you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My, my primary, you're going to edit this I assume, later, we'll see. more or less. It depends on what you say. Okay. <laughs> Uh, as a bassist in a jazz group, or frankly, as a bassist in any group, there is a, a lot of function in your job description. You have to function rhythmically, and you have to function harmonically. And I've discovered after all of these years, and after having listened to hundreds of other bassists, that there are limited numbers of ways of effectively guiding a band through the harmony of a song and the bass lines that we construct in the moment have to function to help shape the harmony. In other words, if we've all, all agreed that we're going to play Happy Birthday in the key of F and the pianist or guitarist or another harmonic instrument, although it's not required, you know, once we agree on the chord changes, that I have to function in a way in which I create the bottom of that harmony, which is the, the base, the foundation for it. And that in working my way to the next chord in a song, I have to effectively guide everybody so they know where we're going. The pianist has to do it too, but I can do it without the pianist. Mm -hmm. And he could do it without me, he or she. Um, so my philosophy is basically one of rhythm, and I guess you would call it basic voice leading, which comes from Bach, essentially. Wow. Those little Bach chorales that we had to learn in music school, those bass lines are unbelievable. And when I listen to my favorite bass players, whether they know it or not, that's what they're doing. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm particularly fond of Ron Carter's bass lines. When Ron Carter walks a bass line, I can often hear the implied harmony between the major resting places in, in a song. Mm -hmm. I can go, oh yeah, there's like a, that would be a diminished chord and that would be a dominant chord and that, that gets me to the next place. It's all in there. Paul Chambers also. It's a big responsibility. It is. Because you can, you can mess up two things at once, right? Yes. Well, we all can. You can, I can. I'm good at messing up all kinds of things. But yes, you know, really good bass players in many ways drive a band more than a drummer in many ways. I, I concur because you think of some of the famous trios with guitar, piano, and bass. Hardly any with piano, drums, and reed instrument, or something like that. I mean, the bass is more to be missed, I think, when it's not there. I would agree, and that yeah. keeps, keeps us employed. Yeah, <laughs> and especially if you play the stand-up. Um, what happens as a bassist when someone calls a tune that you don't know? Uh, after I've gotten over my initial panic, I always confess I don't know that song, or I say I haven't played that song in a long time, which is often the case, um, and I might ask the pianist if he knows it to just quickly, you know, jump through the chords, or just, if it's simple enough, he'll go, all right, the first part is an F starts on the one chord, the bridge starts on the two chord, and unless it's really you know, uh, challenging, I can usually find my way through it, and you know, the more songs you know, the more you realize that is the same chords as the bridge to that, you know, and at some point, sometimes you even mess that up, mm -hmm. 
You go, oh, it's this. oh, wait, 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 we're playing this, not that. So, being honest when you don't know it, I think is a very good thing to do because sure. it, people are relying on you. It's like saying, hey man, uh, go fly that 747. You go, hey, I've only flown a Cessna, you know? <laughs> And there's always other songs that could be called. So, so why? Yes, yes. And I always ask guys if they, you know, if they have something unusual, bring it. I want to know what chords you're going to play, especially if you've reharmonized the standard. Yeah. You know, I want to know. I don't want to be the guy going, really? We're going. That's yeah. to what end? I, I was reading a, a word that popped out about some of the stuff that's been written about you was. Uh, Ubiquitous, like you're all over the place, I guess. And I wondered if, if you made a conscious career be, a choice between classical and jazz, could you have gone either way? Well, I would say that you know I started out as a classical bass student mm -hmm. at the Eastman School of Music, which is a pretty well-known conservatory. Uh, I was good enough to get in. I think they only took four or five of us uh, at a time. I Now, when I look at the guys, my friends who play in the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, the New York Philharmonic, I say to myself, there's no way. I could never play that Wagner tone poem. There's <laughs> no way. Because, you know, I realize now that I have spent most of my career playing popular music. And it's a different skill set, um, and it's, it, it's, a, it's another art form. Even though the bass lines function much in the same way. Beethoven's bass lines are fantastic, and the voice leading is unbelievable. Mozart, it's, it's the same thing. But you have to spend a lot of time practicing with the bow and learning, learning those parts there near impossible for me. Those guys breeze through it like it's a blues. <laughs> so I don't know that it was a conscious effort, but I kind of just started getting involved in jazz and popular music. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy all kinds of music. I have occasionally been called to play something with a symphony. Hey, can you play in the bass section? We're doing Beethoven's Ninth. And I always say, <laughs> honesty again, there's probably ten other guys you might want to call first, but I'd love to do it. You know, one of my friends says, come on, just do it. And I usually mm -hmm. stand at the end of the bass section and have a great time. Mm -hmm. And it's always educational, because those guys that really know Beethoven's Ninth and have been playing it for 40 years, I mean, there's a lot of information coming out of those instruments. Yeah. So, with pop music, I found myself getting called for certain things. I do play electric bass as well, although it's not my primary instrument. Mm -hmm. And I know my limitations on that yeah. instrument as well. So, um, as an acoustic bassist, I've gotten a, a chance to record a lot of pop music. Yeah. People like Rod Stewart, and George Michael, and Linda Ronstadt, and others like that. Yeah, I was looking at your discography on your website, and. I think it was between 1997 and 2008. I actually counted on, your, on the screen. It was hard. <laughs> there was like 125 records there. Yeah. And, and I'm sure you've done a few since 2008. I have. No. Yeah. So why do you get those calls in your mind? Um, well, it depended on the music and the producer. Um, you know, first of all, I show up in, on time. <laughs> There's a lot of money at stake when somebody's making a record. Like those Rod Stewart Sing Standards records, they spent a fortune. You can't come walking in even five minutes late to a session. So I had a good reputation um, in that department. I uh, was fortunate enough to do a lot of work for a producer named Phil Ramone. And Phil, um, he called me for a lot of things, and I think part of it is because I, t I take direction. I keep my mouth shut unless I'm asked, uh, 
for, to make a contribution because there's a lot of egos flying on around the room on a recording session. Um, I try to play in tune. <laughs> Um, there's no such thing as perfect intonation, and it's, I'm certainly not in the running for that, but I, you know, I'm trying to be very careful about, and that's part of my function also, how, you know, being in tune with the piano, because I know there are going to be layers of sounds over me. Um, I think I'm good at playing with a click and still having it swing. Oh, that's important, yeah. Yeah. Um, and on a lot of them, I stayed under the radar when <laughs> I've seen explosive situations in recording studios. And, and I always managed to just, you know, if it was going south and I wasn't being asked to help, I let, it, I let the, the people in charge do their job. People get really upset, and I've seen it happen. Uh, you know, yeah, we should play sticks instead of brushes at the bridge. And I've seen a producer go, who asked you to tell the drummer this or that, you know? So like the piano player, or maybe someone might say that, and like, who, who asked you? Right? Yeah, I mean, there's a way to make that contribution. And, you know, if you're really feeling it, you could say, hey, I have a thought. But uh, I found that for the most part, a good producer, or, or oftentimes an arranger with a clear vision, if he's really good, it's displayed for you, it's written on the chart. Or he'll say, hey, David, walk on the bridge. Don't, uh, I was wrong. Don't play it in two. Go into four. Those kind of things. Nice. I hate it when I go into the studio and, and nobody knows what they're doing. Oh. It's, it's like, uh, you want your brain surgeon not to know what he's doing? I mean, come on. <laughs> well, let's take the Rod Stewart thing for an example. Was, mm -hmm. was he singing while, while the rhythm section was playing? Uh, he was on one or two sessions that we did in Los Angeles. For the most part, no. Someone else tracked his vocals for him. Oh, and, so, someone else sings it? So that you have a reference point? Or he something? has a reference. Yeah, we have a reference. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know whether he even knew some of these songs, so he, you know, he could learn them from somebody else. Probably shouldn't be saying that on camera. That's okay. But uh, he was not there for most of them. Right. And uh, this is not uncommon. Mm -hmm. I did an entire record uh, with uh, Gladys Knight, without Gladys Knight, with a really wonderful singer who tracked for her named Vanice Thomas. What's her name? Vanice Thomas. And Vanice is the daughter of Rufus Thomas. Oh. Funky chicken. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's a great singer, and she tracked a bunch of standards, and we played with her. And then I guess Glad well, Gladys, I don't know where she lives. I don't think she lives in New York, so she might have put her parts on in Los Angeles. Yeah. You know, it is interesting when you're doing a record for a singer. I've done some studio work, and if no one is singing, especially from a piano player, it's like you're thinking, I might, maybe I shouldn't be playing here. What am I covering up, potentially? And that's a weird... Feeling. It is a weird feeling. It affects, along with what you, you experienced, it affects the overall flow of the song. Uh, I happen to know a lot of songs. I love songs and songwriters. and So uh, oftentimes I, I know the tune um, and kind of have an idea what the lyric might be at a certain point. But it's actually, it's, it's not an ideal way to make a record with anybody. If if you're really making music in the human way, you know, music is made very differently now for the most part. They extract a, a rhythm track from uh, Marvin Gaye, as, as we know uh, from hearing about the Pharrell, <laughs> Robin Thicke stuff, and they oh, extract yeah. this idea from that one. And oftentimes they're um, fragments of uh, files, sound files, that are actually lifted. I can't tell you how many times I've heard a James Brown drum part, or even James Brown making a sound inserted into somebody's song. And the result is like, yeah, I mean, some of it feels great, and some of it's fun and everything, but it's not the same as playing music live with somebody else. And sadly, 
we have a generation or maybe two now of listeners who have no idea. My children who have heard a lot of music and come to my jobs and concerts and travel. You know, when they turn on the radio and they sing along with these songs, I say to myself, that's not a song. Or, or that guy's not singing, he's really yelling at me. You know, and I say, hey man, if you're gonna sing, sing. Don't talk, <laughs> sing. And certainly don't yell. I don't need to be yelled at. Oh, you sound just like me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know it's uh, old school, you know, but, but the truth of the matter is that these people have made the mistake of not learning from what came before. And with the advent of the technology that we have, those people don't know anything about songs. They don't know what makes a Stevie Wonder song a great song, let alone an Irving Berlin song or Cole Porter or Stephen Foster for that matter. They've learned to stick stuff together over a drum beat. And I'll be the first to say, I love the way some of those things feel. Because, you know, they're funky. But for me, I could put on an Earth, Wind and Fire record that was recorded in the 70s and go, that's just as funky as this rap artist. Mm -hmm. And it's got a good melody and a great arrangement, and it's human. And they're not yelling. Philip Bailey is singing. <laughs> and that, that means something. Hopefully it'll come back. I, I don't know. Yeah. And it, it's funny from a, from a bass player standpoint, too, that that part of the music has become so predominant. You know, when, when the car goes by, by you, and you hear the <laughs> and I, I sometimes wonder, well, what does a bass player think of that? Are they happy about that? That bass line functions in that piece most of the time. I mean, usually, you know, there's a drum loop and there's a bass line that works. And, you know, I, I don't really like it because most of them aren't really inventive or creative in any way. Um, and most of the time it's not even a bass player. Right. The bass player Marcus Miller is a fantastic electric bass player. And actually he can play acoustic bass also, which is a little frightening for me because <laughs> he's, he's something else. He has played classic bass lines on songs where I go, that is inventive. How did he think of that? Like, he's a wonderful musician. Also, uh, Anthony Jackson is a favorite of mine. Mm -hmm. um, but the stuff that's, that's made with loops and on a computer and glued together, I, I, I just don't consider it songwriting at its best. Yeah. And I don't consider it music making at its best. I'm not saying it's invalid. It's just, it's not to my taste. Right. Well, it reminds me of when my father would come into the room when I was playing the Beatles, and he'd go, what's wrong with your record player? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Some things never change. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I think that, I mean, my parents, interestingly enough, they liked the Beatles. My parents recognized good songs, so it didn't bother them. They thought the Beatles were cute, and, you know, because we were going nuts, like, you know, it was, I think that your argument has to be well defended. And if you can specifically say, here's what I don't like about this, and here's what I do like about that. I mean, of the rap artists, I like Snoop Dogg. I think he's got a groove, he swings, he's humorous. Um, I don't like... I'm not going to mention the guys that I don't like, but, you know, I don't really... I feel like they're yelling and the ideas are violent or misogynistic or, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't, it just doesn't appeal to me. I understand it's a reflection of society, dot, dot, dot. Now, don't expect it to sound like Jerome Kern. <laughs> but I don't think it's great songwriting. 
or music making. Well, you have a solo record out now, correct? Yes. Did you, um, were you able to record that as an ensemble? I did record most of it as an ensemble. There were a couple of solo, a couple of guys that weren't, Bob Shepard lives in Los Angeles, and I said, I just need two short solos. So mm -hmm. I, I did that high tech with yeah. email. Um, did you actually do it? Uh, he didn't come? He didn't come. I sent him the file. Uh -huh. and he played to the rhythm section. Right. But he knows how to play to a rhythm section. Okay. As does uh, Jeremy Pelt was the trumpet mm -hmm. player, and Jeremy, I was actually there for Jeremy's part. He couldn't make my session, so I see. he came in later. And, um, you know, that might be cheating a little bit, according to my philosophy about music. But um, I also like the way he reacted to what was on the track. Mm -hmm. And he did it in a pass or two. So I didn't feel like he dissected everything and worked everything Right, out. or that he, that he laid down seven solos and you took no, bar one from this and that. We didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, when you do your own, was that, was that an invest, investment on your part to do your own CD, or did you have a, a record label? Record label. Okay. That's good. I yeah. mean, yes. a lot of projects, you know, the artists uh, paid for them themselves. And yeah, they do. Um, you know, again, unfortunately, between piracy and the ease with which we can exchange music files, um, record companies have lost a lot. Not that there's any love between me and record companies because I've watched them over the years make a mess of a lot of things, mm -hmm. but they've lost a lot. And that's why they they're all doing these they're called 360 deals. They they want to make the record, produce it, and they want to manage you, and they want to sell your T-shirts, and they want to be your agent. So, in that case, they're not signing too many jazz musicians. I see. But I can tell you, I've been involved with the union pretty pretty heavily in the last you know. 15 or 20 years, and I've gone to some of the negotiations with the record company, I guess the management, because they have collective bargaining agreements between record companies and the musicians' union. And I saw graphs of charts of how the money is divided. Record company, distributor, uh, truck driver, who schleps the CDs around, got down, and the musicians were at the bottom. And I remember the president of our union saying, I could multiply that by 20 and you still wouldn't see it. And I sat there and I said to myself, we're the ones making the product. It should be the exact opposite. Wow. But that's sort of what everything, I guess, has dissolved into that at this mm -hmm. point. When you play on a record like uh, Rod Stewart, that sold a lot of records. That was like a platinum. Yeah, multi-platinum. Do you get paid more for a successful record like that than you do from playing for some other jazz artist who's not going to sell a tenth of Like a Mark Murphy record, you mean? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's like... It's... Musicians get paid for their work at the session. It's right. essentially an hourly system. Mm -hmm. It's a scale. Um, then there is a special payments fund, and that is where we get some type of a royalty. So, and it's not based on the success of the record. That, that fund is funded by successful records. Right. This but is an ASCAP thing. No. Oh, okay. No, this is a... Jeez, oh, I forgot what it's called. I think it's called Secondary Markets Fund or something. But oh. we get... Like if you've done a hundred record sessions in a year, you'll get a check that reflects that. I see. And then if the song gets put in a movie or on a TV show or in a video game, which is common now, um, it's been registered and 
in theory, you get some extra payment for that, as opposed to getting your $5 for doing a record and, and mm. goodbye. So I've always been strongly in favor of the union because it protects us and it allows us to have a little bit of something, you know, back end down the line. And my record or someone's small record doesn't make generate enough money to contribute to that fund. But the Rod Stewart records did and J Lo records or what, yeah. whatever and by J-Lo, I don't mean Joe Lovano. <laughs> <laughs> no, I knew you did not. <laughs> but anyway, that's... Yeah, so, you, you know, you do make a little bit extra. Yeah. Um, the Spotify and the whole thing is another delivery system now. And Do you get surprised by checks you receive in the mail for things, for things you did and you don't even remember? I don't think I've gotten a check from Spotify. Yeah, I, I kind of mixed my uh, my I, question there. Um, every now and then I'll get a check. Um, there are, in fact, much to the credit of the current um, American Federation of Musicians Administration and the administration at Local 802, um, I have gotten some checks from performance rights organizations in other parts of the world. And um, I know that they have made an effort to travel to Germany and make a deal with the... There's money there. There's always money there. Um, so every now and then I go, well, it might not be a lot. It might just be 60 bucks or 80 bucks or whatever. But they go, wow, okay, we're, we're not lost. <laughs> right. And somehow the system is working. It's nice to know. That. It works poorly and uh, there's a lot of dishonesty. And mm. I think in, in the United States, it's really bad. Mm. Um, for a lot of different reasons, education being part of it. I mean, it, you know, for my kids, even though their dad is a musician, they they grew up with, hey, check out this song, and, you know, emailing each other tunes, and that's how it is. I bet that they knew what the word gig meant. My kids, yeah. Long, uh, yeah. when they were quite young. Yeah. 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 Uh, is the life of a musician and, and a busy one, is it hard to be a family man? Whatever yes. that might mean. I, I, I would say yes, it is. It is stressful, mostly because of the travel and the hours. Mm -hmm. I missed a lot of events because I was in Japan, all right, in Europe. Um, yeah, it can be difficult. On the other hand, you know, my my girls came to Paris and my son came to London. They got to do some things yeah. nice. that the average kid might not get to do, and they've met famous people. And or people although they didn't even know who George Michael was, of course. I was, was going to say, they they're, met people they didn't know like, were famous. Dad, who is this guy? And there's a stadium full of people screaming, you know. I was like a rock star for a minute there. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. I'm assuming you were playing the electric bass. I was, no, I was playing both. Okay. I had done a record with George in uh -huh. uh, 1999. And he decided to do some of those songs, nice. so I got the call. Guy's unbelievable talent. Really great singer. Wow. Every night, he knocked me out. So, What do you like to see um, from up-and-coming singers as far as taking care of their own business? And I don't mean, I mean musical business. It's, uh, that's a good question. I like singers who are prepared, that have music for their songs in their key, um, who know the, their tempos. Um, those, those are the basics from singers. I've worked with a lot of singers. I think I've worked with just about every singer I've ever wanted to, with the exception of Frank Sinatra. And James Taylor. Hmm. But I worked with Jack Jones, and I played for Peggy Lee, and many, many others. Rosemary Clooney. And Joe Williams. Joe Williams. But singers, it, it's, it always amazes me, because they have the most potential to communicate the most 
stuff within a song. They've got the lyrics and they have the melody and they have the chance to express those things. And it's not easy keeping that balance between words and music. But most of them just don't do it. Most of them, I find, listen to themselves sing and make themselves more important than the song. Mm -hmm. And that is a, it's a hard thing to get away from. I can understand how it happens. But I remember playing for Rosemary Clooney toward the end. She, she had nothing left. Nothing. I mean, her voice was really going. And she sang, uh, What'll I do when you are far? And I said, you know what? That's my Aunt Rose singing right to me. She communicated all of the emotion of, of the song without the voice. Others are so busy showing you what they've got, their voice, that they completely lose sight of what the song is. Mm. I'll give one example, and I think she's a great singer, Christina Aguilera. She can really sing. But I saw her on TV sing Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, and it was unrecognizable. Pyrotechnics. Yeah, have yourself a man, yeah, 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 really little crazy. Yes, man. And you know, it, it's amazing. And then I, was, I sat there and I said, just sing the song. Can't you just sing the song? Otherwise, sing it, write your own. Because it didn't make it more emotional. It didn't deliver anything more. It was just her being about her. And, you know, I get upset by this stuff because, you know, if it's a song I really like and somebody does that, I'm like, oh, God, why are you doing that? <laughs> Frank Sinatra, in my opinion, probably one of the greatest musicians I could think of, had a way of making you, uh, had a way of making the song um, present itself. I know he's been accused of changing words, or, you know, some, some of his renditions aren't to my taste, but the bulk of his work is unsurpassed. And many times when he changed a word, I think he had a good reason for doing it. Some words swing harder than others. Uh -huh. If you say the, it doesn't swing. That has punctuation at the end. And if you place that in the right place, it makes a difference. Granted, Cole Porter may not have <laughs> written the word that, but Frank, I think Frank knew some stuff that a lot of people didn't know. And actually, there's a very funny story. I guess Cole Porter got upset with Frank changing some of the words, and he sent Frank a letter saying, if you can't sing my songs as I wrote them, please don't sing them. Ooh. And Frank wrote back, if you don't like the royalty checks, send them back. <laughs> I think it worked out okay, but I could tell you this. I saw Frank sing uh, two or three times. Carnegie Hall, I jumped out of my seat like it was the Beatles. When he walked out on stage, I was like, whoa. It was exquisite. Nice. And then I heard him later at Radio City Music Hall, and I was way in the back in the nosebleed seats, the only ones I could afford. But he sang um, One for My Baby. And it wasn't even that I felt like he was singing to me. I felt like I was sitting at the bar next to him. Like, that's, that's pretty amazing. Really a super talent that that man was. That's a nice, uh, nice tribute you just gave him. I spent some time really analyzing the, the effect of the Fly Me to the Moon, the thing he did with Basie and the Quincy Jones arrangement, and I said, oh my God, that's just like a perfect piece of music. And at the end where he goes, hot damn, it's like, <laughs> where does that come from? That's just... <laughs> I don't know. But it's funny, you know, when I... But I, in fact, I was, on the way here, I was listening to... Uh, I don't remember what's on. Uh, witchcraft. Uh -huh. It's a great arrangement. And I realized 
one of the things about Sinatra that's so fantastic is he's in no hurry. If I sing along, I always get there before he does. I'm like, you know what? He's relaxed. Joe Williams was like that, too. No panic. Even when they're going fast. Hey. Mm -hmm. Peggy Lee, also. I remember playing with her, and we played uh, Them, Their Eyes. And we, we were like... Maybe we're double time underneath her. Or maybe it was what a little moonlight can do. I can't Probably. remember. Yeah, that can really and she just cruised along. And she was swinging. It wasn't, she wasn't like floating in space. She was in it with us. But didn't feel like we were going 75 miles per hour. Mm. Really did not. It's kind of special, that yeah. stuff. Good horn players like that, too. Yeah. Have you ever played with a singer or an instrumentalist who played so far behind the beat that you thought... I better slow down. Um, not that I'd better slow down, but that I'd better make sure it doesn't slow down, that the song doesn't slow down. Yeah, there's some guys I play with who, who play behind the beat, and it, it can be annoying. It's kind of like having somebody. Now, is that true for drummers, too? I had people sort of debate about um, playing on top of the time, playing behind the time, and then some people say, the time is the time. Like, if you're on top of the time, then you're rushing. Well, I don't know that I agree with that statement. I think that there is a way where music leans forward and leans backward. And we're not, you know, we're not machines. Mm -hmm. And you know, even with a click track, you can lean forward and it can be okay. And I always felt like there were some classic rhythm sections where um, the drummer might be, uh, the bass player might be a little ahead of the drummer if you really put it up on a screen and analyzed it. Mm -hmm. And it feels unbelievable. And for whatever reason, I mean, Ray Brown used to really drive hard. And with Oscar, I mean, they would, they would rush, but who cares? <laughs> it, was, it was fantastic. So, yeah, that's a... I, I don't think there's a rule about that. You know, if you listen to Basie, Basie's band, you know, on certain figures, they, they sit back. Mm -hmm. There's a great record of Peggy Lee singing Cy Coleman's I've Got Your Number. And there are a couple of horn figures where you can just hear the lead trumpet set player must have said, we're playing it like this. And they just play the figure just a little more relaxed than the rest of the band is. And it's great. I mean, to me, that's, that's the music. Do you have any memories when you were a kid that you can think about now that made that, that you realized you had a sense of time and that you could feel grooves and feel the beat Ooh. Uh, I, where I could feel the beat I mean, I think did, I, I, did you used to listen, for instance, to like the top 40 and, and get a sense of movement? Oh, yeah, sure. You know, there was top 40 music that appealed to me for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, I always, I mean, I don't know how old I was when, when, I heard, when I really got into how something felt. Is that what you're asking me? How, yeah. Maybe... Maybe I wasn't aware of it until I was 12 or 13 or mm -hmm. 14. But I, I may have responded to it okay. previously. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think that pop music is, is good for that. Definitely good for it. It's a lot easier to understand boom, crack, boom, boom, crack, but then it is to go bang, chang, bang, chang, bang, 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 bang. Yeah. That's a much more complicated and fluid and uh, difficult thing to grab onto initially. 
And then when you, when you digest it a little bit, you could realize, wow, that really does feel good, the way they do that. Mm -hmm. Of course, certain drummers stand out who you can hear it in their cymbal. But for young people, I think, and I don't even want to call it simple, but there is a simplicity to the, you know, uh, bass drum, snare drum thing. It, it's clear. And yeah. it's a good start. You can feel the backbeat. You can feel the backbeat. I mean, yeah. Jazz has a backbeat too. Mm -hmm. It's just that, especially on the drums, you know, in jazz you lead with the ride cymbal more than the, the bass drum and snare drum, mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a different orchestration yeah. in a way. I want to play a couple little pieces of music here and just see if you have a, any kind of comment. Uh, <coughs> Four. That was uh, Marcus Miller and Victor Wooten and Stanley Clark. Do you, do you have any reaction to that? Um, I think they sound terrific. I, I mean, as a as an electric bass player, Marcus is one of my all time favorites. Stanley. I actually prefer on acoustic bass. I love the way he sounds, mm -hmm. or sounded. I haven't heard him recently. I think the guy was an unbelievable bass player. Um, Victor, he's he's astounding technically. I I don't have him on any. I don't have any Victor Wooten records for whatever for whatever reason. But I think that's good. That's great. Yeah. And you can hear, I don't know who's playing the solo, if that's Marcus or... I think it was Marcus and Victor. Actually, I think Stanley was playing acoustic, just he was just doing the... Then, I mean, the you can hear the... Marcus playing behind the beat. I mean, he's totally laid back on, on his solo uh -huh. against the feel. Yeah. Feels good. Yeah. It, it's almost like a extreme bass, you know, like extreme sports for, yes. for the bass. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The thing that scares me about Marcus... I, I did this jazz cruise. Actually, John Fitchhawk does it every year, and Marcus has been on it, and his band's unbelievable, and he plays a great slap bass solo that's very melodic. It's not just, hey, look what I can do, and he plays great melodies. And then he put the bass down, and he picked up the bass clarinet and played When I Fall in Love. Oh my and I was like, now I really don't like you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I hate yeah. when guys can do all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. He plays guitar and yeah. keyboard. And, uh, yeah, he pretty much like made Miles records, oh, you know, like yeah. get it all done. Okay, Miles, come in and play a few notes, right? And it's very funny. There's a great track called Funkin' for Jamaica or Jamaica Funk. It was a Tom Brown record. My friend Buddy Williams was playing drums on it. And it's a great bass line. And I knew that Marcus was on the record. But he said to me, Marcus isn't playing bass on that, he's playing guitar. <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> uh, oh, God. Okay. <laughs> Let me tell you something. That record is one of the records of which I am most proud. Mm. And I played in Paquito de Rivera's band for, I guess, for probably about five years. And I was recommended to Paquito by Claudio Roditi, who's a wonderful trumpet player, Brazilian guy. 
who I guess heard that I had a, some kind of a sense of this music. I, I always liked it. Like even in high school, I remember I'd turn on the salsa station and go, man, that's cool. And the bass players totally function like in a... There's another example of functioning uh, as the base of the rhythm and harmony. And you have to maintain... There's some rules about playing Latin music to which you must adhere, which, uh, you know, us gringos d do the best we can because uh, I didn't grow up with it. <laughs> But what happened was both Paquito and Claudio, who were very open and helpful, we'd be playing, and I remember Paquito coming over and singing in my ear a cha-cha-cha bass line, a very traditional one. And I played, no, 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 that, 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 and then I get it. And so that, that, that was like, on the spot training. And Claudio did the same thing with samba. He might sing a little rhythm or a little line that was a traditional samba rhythm that I could incorporate. That helped a lot. Um, in Paquito's band, we also had um, a drummer who was very strong with that stuff, and the pianist that I think that's Danilo Perez on that. I think so. And uh, so that became, uh, I became a student with those guys, and I, I don't even know if I could do that now. I was pretty good at it then. And it's a different mindset, and now when I listen to uh, like a really great Latin jazz bass player like, like Andy Gonzalez, and I hear him play, and I go, no, he's got, there's an accent that he's got that I, that I don't have. And a dear friend of mine made me a copy of a beautiful record, talk about stealing stuff and mm. making illegal copies. <laughs> but he wanted me to hear this record, and he was on it. And it was an Eddie Palmieri record. And he said, listen to the bass player. And the bass player played a little behind. Mm. He played, you know, in the bass line, Theoretically, you'd be playing. That's how I play it. He played. He was. He had this the six going, which is part of it. He has the six going over the four, and he was completely loose with it. And when you, uh, I guess, insert that into the machinery of the rest of the rhythm section. It feels unbelievable. And I try to do it. I played along with the record. I kind of got it, but, you know, it's like speaking another language. Yes, and I think you almost have to have grown up with that kind of music, too. So it's not foreign. You don't start, you're not starting in a foreign place. It's just a groove you understand. And, and a lot of it comes from language. It's interesting because oh. I, I, I realize, you know, when... Uh, I'd listen, when I, on Paquito's band, when I'd listen to the Cuban guys speaking, sometimes I'd go, well, you know, that sounds like, it sounds like congas. It sounds like, because they were like fast and loud and, and exciting. And I was like, yeah, it sounded, it sounded like uh, Giovanni Ildago, conga solo to me. And, Who was that name you just said? Giovanni Ildago. Oh, okay. He's great. Oh. He's Puerto Rican. Great. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm kunga player, maybe, you know, one of the greatest in the world. Uh -huh. um, and also in Brazilian music, you know, you hear certain things in the language that are part of the music and vice versa. And some of it, I think, comes from the indigenous world, jungle sounds, uh, tropical sounds. All of the drum stuff, of course, is African-based. Yeah. In... in Cuban music and Brazilian music, well, all music really. Um, but there's a connection to language for sure. Do you ever, uh, sometimes I fascinate about, you know, living in another era. And I wondered if, if you'd ever have done that. For musical reasons. Yeah, you know, every now and then I, I wish I had been maybe a generation and a half or two generations before. 
I would have. Do you need to get that or no? Nah. No. Um, I I think you know it, before the music business be, went digital, and um, <laughs> yeah, and there were some players that I would have loved to have had the opportunity to work with. Um, so yeah, once in a while. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose everybody does. And of course, you know, business-wise, all the guys a generation or two older than me go, oh, yeah, you should have been in New York in the 1960s yeah. through 79. You know, because there were more jobs than there were players. They were so doing three dates a day. They were very busy. But, you know, the, the it looks like you're busy to me, from what I've read about you. Is that a fair statement? Um, I would say generally I am. Um, but, you know, our business is affected by the economy mm -hmm. um, and, you know, usually the first thing to go, n nobody, nobody's going to eliminate the flow of oil and gas and electricity, but they can do without entertainment if they have to. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say now there seem to be fewer and fewer recording sessions, although I've been producing records for people. And I do my best to do it all with live musicians. And, uh, and the guys really, we always have a great time. They go, oh man, this is like the old days. It's actually a big band. Or, uh -huh. man, I remember when we used to do this twice a week. And, um, and I think for that reason, because they're live players, I think the records sound really good. Mm -hmm. Does anything, uh, what, what, get, what makes you angry? Well, you mean in music, or I, I guess, but in general, what really pushes your buttons? Well, to be honest, several things push my buttons. Unfairness troubles me. Um, racism disgusts me. In fact, in my mother, once when I was young, said something very, very funny, and I reminded her, it's not funny, it's true and humorous, and I reminded her of this not too long ago. At some point when I was, I don't know how old I was, there was some, something racially charged was on the news. And she said, she said, you know, it's really stupid to dislike somebody for what they look like or what they weigh or... You know, to dismiss an entire group of people like that is stupid. When there are plenty of really good reasons to hate people on an individual basis. <laughs> and you know, she's right. Jerks come in all sizes, shape, and colors. It's not, it's not. So that bothers me. And um, I don't like people who impose their religious beliefs on others. Mm -hmm. I find that highly offensive, and particularly offensive when they are people who are elected to work for us in government. That troubles me. Without getting into it, I think you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. I and I have no problem with people believing whatever they choose to believe. Um, but you, know, you, can't, you can't throw that at others right. and expect them to think the way you do because we're all Americans. That's ridiculous. Well said. Well, um, we're just about an hour here. And, oh, wow. Yeah, so really enjoyed talking to you. Likewise. Maybe down the road we'll do part two. And I would love to. And you, did you drive all the way up here from New York today? I live in New City, New York, which is 30 or so miles okay. north of the city. So Yeah, yeah it was exactly. still a hike. Yeah, it was about three and a half. But you got to listen to some Sinatra. I listened to Sinatra, and I, you know, I got my uh, yeah. headphones, so I talked to a few, few friends. Yeah, and, uh, good. Yeah, past the time. I'm used to traveling. Yes. So. For a while, I taught at Bennington College, so I used to do it in a day. I would drive up in the morning through Albany and then over into Vermont to teach, and then usually I would drive back at home, yeah. back home afterwards. So. That's a long day. Yeah, it was a long day, and 
I have some good stories about that too. <laughs> well, good luck. I know you're working with a good crew tonight, and I, I have a gig myself, but uh -huh. I hope to get there to, for the end of it. Okay, so, great. Yeah, great. Is that a nice place? I've never played there. It's before. it's it's a per little performance space. Uh -huh. it's, it's narrow and it's but it's hip. Oh, so it's, it was like a concert? Yes, it's like a little concert. Oh, People good. People sit and um, it's a series. They got a grant for it. And uh, so it'll be nice. That's great. Yeah. That's terrific. And there's a little coffee shop next door and a bar across the street. Well, I'll be at the coffee shop. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you.